As I mentioned, there are a couple of strategies that you can use on the critical reading section. Remember, you're not going to know all the vocabulary words that show up in the sentence completion problems, nor are you going to know all the vocabulary in the passage-based questions. You're not going to have read every passage, so it's really important to have a couple strategies in your back pocket that you can use. The first strategy is something called using context clues. I know you probably use this in class and your English teacher tells you to use this all the time, but what does this look like on the SAT? Let's take, an, let's take a look at an example. Here we have a sentence completion question, and it reads, the publisher decided to blank the work, reducing it from over 600 pages to just under 200. Well, what goes in the word? Let's look at the context or the words surrounding that blank to figure out what it is. So we have the publisher, so we know it may be a word that has to do with something literary. We know that he decided, he or she, decided to blank the work. That's the word we're trying to figure out. And here's an important one, reducing. So it's going to be a word that maybe means reducing or shortening. And then this is kind of it from over 600 pages to just under 200. So that's really just kind of reinforcing this idea of reducing. Well, let's take a look at our answer choices to see. Improve. Well, that doesn't really quite make sense, but we can eliminate it. So let's put a little question mark. Alleviate. Doesn't really make sense at all. Anthologize. Well, I don't know what that means, so let's go ahead and skip it. Abridge. Well, I know abridge means to shorten, so this could be a really good one. De debunk. That doesn't make any sense. Like debunk a myth. Let's cross that out. So even if we don't know what all these words mean, we basically have eliminated two answer choices, which means that we should guess regardless. The answer to this question is abridge. Let's go ahead and read it back with the word. The publisher decided to abridge the work, reducing it from over 600 pages to just under 200. That makes sense. We used our context clues to determine the meaning of the word that should go in the blank, and then we eliminated a few answer choices and chose accordingly. Let's take a look at our next strategy rephrase and predict. This works really well for passage-based questions and sentence completion questions. Let's take a look at what I mean. Though Kayla insists that she can fix her bad habits, her friends and family consider her blank. Well, what should go in the blank? Let's predict a word. You can do this, like I said, with sentence completion questions, or if you're reading a question in the passages, you can really oftentimes rephrase the question and predict. So let's see. Though Kaylin says she can fix her bad habits, her friends and family consider her, let's say, unfixable. I know it really doesn't make much sense in SAT land, but this is basically the gist of what we're trying to go for. So let's take a look at our, our words. Facile, well, if you know from Spanish, facile means easy, so we can kind of eliminate that even if we don't really know the meaning of the word. Incorrigible, well, we often hear about incorrigible children. That seems about right. Let's keep that. Let's take a look at our other ones. Catastrophic, definitely not unfixable. Predictable, no way. Benign, well, you might not know what that means, so let's keep it. Even if you eliminate three of these answer choices and you don't know what the other two words mean, you have a 50-50 shot of getting it correct, which means you should guess. The answer to this question is incorrigible. Though Kayla insists she can fix her bad habits, her friends and family consider her incorrigible, which means unfixable. So even if you don't really quite know what the answers mean, you can always sort of predict and eliminate answer choices accordingly, which gives you a great shot at getting the correct one. Let's take a look at our third strategy. Don't read everything. This is really important, especially for the passage-based question. On the SAT and the PSAT, you have limited time, so you can't read everything. Well, what should you read? Let's take a look at a sample passage, and I'll point out what you should read. Every passage in the SAT has a couple sentences at the beginning that tell you what the passage is about, sometimes, who is written by, and usually the date. And here, we see that it's an excerpt from The Room of One Own, a book written by Virginia Woolf. So if you know anything about Virginia Woolf, you know that she was a feminist author back in the mid-19th century. It's pretty important context. So after we read the little blurb about what the passage is about, it's really important just to skim and scan the topic sentences of the whole passage. Now, why do we do this? Why don't we read the whole thing? On the PSAT, you don't get points for reading the passage. You get points for answering the questions correctly. It makes a lot of sense. Also, the questions on the PSAT, like the SAT, are really specific. They're gonna ask something like, why did the author list the topics in lines 15 through 17? 
My guess is by the time you get to the end of the passage, you're not going to remember what the topics were in 15 through 17, nor why the author listed it. So it's not really important to read the whole passage. It's just important to skim and scan it so you get an idea of what it's about so that you can answer the questions. That's it. So let's skim through a sample passage just to see and for me to point out what exactly you should read. So we already read the top blurb, and here we have the first paragraph. I can't fit the whole passage on the screen, so I kind of broke it up. And on the side right here, you see that we have some line reference numbers. Now, it's not important to note these, but when you go back with the questions, it's important that you know what these mean. So here we go. What we'll do is we'll just read the topic sentence for each paragraph. So, it was disappointing not to have brought back in the evening some important statement, some authentic fact. Well, we don't really know what it means so far, but let's continue on. The second paragraph. For it's a perennial puzzle why no woman wrote a word of that extraordinary literature when every other man, it seemed, was capable of song or sonnet. Well, if you know anything about Virginia Woolf, like we said, she's a feminist author in the mid-19th century. So it seems here that what she's doing is she's puzzled about something and why no woman wrote a word of that extraordinary literature. So it's kind of looking like it's a critique, maybe an exploration of a topic of something about women authors. Let's continue. I went therefore to the shelf where the histories stand and took down one of the latest, Professor Trevelyan's History of England. So now she's doing kind of an exploration. She is taking down a history book and looking at something with women authors. That's all we need to know. Let's move on. Yet even so, Professor Trevelyan concludes, neither Shakespeare's women nor those of authentic 17th century memoirs like the Vernese and the Hutchinsons seem wanting a personality and character. So as you can see, there are some complicated names, some names you might not be familiar with that you stumble over, like me, but that's not important. So what she's doing is she's looking at his this professor's work, and just saying that the women in these works seem not wanting of personality and character. So basically, it's just saying that the women in these works were really powerful. Let's move on to the last paragraph. Indeed, if no woman had existence save in the fiction written by men, one would imagine her a person of the utmost importance. There we go. You don't even need to finish reading the whole paragraph. What it basically says is that if no woman had existence save in the fiction written by men, so, what we can conclude from this basically reading of the topic sentences is that Virginia Woolf is writing a historical account of women in fiction back probably around the time that she lived and trying to determine why that women had, if women had no existence save in the fiction written by men, that one would imagine her as a person of the utmost importance. Very various, heroic and mean, splendid and sordid, infinitely beautiful and hideous in the extreme, as great as a man, some think even greater. So even without reading the whole passage and just reading the first topic sentences, we get an idea of what the passage is about so that we can move on and focus our attention on the questions. So I know that this can seem really counterintuitive. Your English teacher always tells you to read thoroughly, but on the PSAT, it's not necessary. Practice the strategy with the materials in the bonus material and in the practice PSAT test. The final strategy. Build your vocabulary. This is really important for not only the sentence completion questions, but also the passages. As you're reading a passage and you're unfamiliar with some words, it's gonna really help to know what some of those words are, to be able to use those context clues to get a better idea. It's just gonna make it much easier. What I would highly recommend is reading publications like The Economist. Don't read Us Weekly, don't read Cosmo Girl, don't read Sports Center or ESPN Magazine. Check out reputable publications like The Economist or The New York Times. Read a little bit every day, probably about 20 minutes is all you need, and it will really help you build your vocabulary. I don't need to tell you that you can't learn to read overnight, but what you can do is you can study up on what the test is gonna be like and become more familiar with it. What you can also do is you can learn and practice some strategies that are going to make the critical reading section much easier for when you sit down to take the PSAT.